got some complaints. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, this talk was supposed to be on um, on efficient constructions or something like that. So I was going to do some constructions of. Uh, uh, encryption scheme signatures, but uh, then I looked at the program, and this talk is really sandwiched in between like the mo two most complicated things you will ever see in your life. Uh, so I think that sort of the purpose of so I thought the purpose of this talk really should be to show you something, but kind of just just kind of keeping your brains idle, you know, not, not turned off completely, but kind of uh, you know resting and ready to go for, for the next thing. So. Um, so what I'm going to show is more like a history of lattice-based encryption that leads to, in some, you know, leads to, in some sense, not chronological sense, uh, a very efficient lattice-based crypto <coughs> system. To the point that I think that lattice-based uh, lattice encryption is, you know, really where we want it to be, and it really has been implemented already by Entrue. And but I'll show you why that's really almost the right thing to do. Uh, I think the more the, the open questions now are signatures, and that's kind of kind of op up in the air. Improvements all the time, every year there's some improvement, and that's a really interesting problem. And I think once we get signatures, lattice-based construction is you know ready to go. Uh, but now let's let's talk about encryption, which is probably the second most important thing one needs in practice. Okay, so some encryption schemes that uh, you might have heard of. There's Entru. This is an um, this was done by Hofstein, Piper, and Silverman in '98. Um, then there's some LWE-based stuff uh, by that you heard the proof by Oded, and then the LWE, LWE constructions by Chris on the first day. Then there's ring LWE-based stuff, and then there's Entru-like based stuff with a proof of security, which is somewhat of a recent result. So this is the chronological order. I'm skipping some stuff. Like there's the Itai Dwork thing, but it doesn't quite fit into what I want to talk about, so I'm going to not mention it. Um, but really, all these schemes, if, if, if you look at them, kind of shuffle them in the right way, you can really get a picture of how things really should have been discovered. <laughs> um, and and this, is, this is sort of the talk I want to give, uh, give now. So, what? What should history should have been like? What would have made a lot more sense than what happened now? Um, so actually, this this whole this lattice based cryptography thing, you could trace its roots to the very beginning uh, of the of public key cryptography with um, with the subset sum problem, which was uh, so in 1979 or something like that, maybe even earlier. People said, "Oh, we can do public key cryptography," and there was. Um, sort of something based on number theory, so the RSA, um, discrete log stuff. And there was something based, which is kind of completely different, based on subset sum. And these were the knapsack crypto systems. Um, unfortunately, the knapsack crypto systems died out. Because every time somebody proposed something new, um, it was broken. And uh, this kind of this breaking and uh, constructing kept going and going for a while, until people just said, look, enough. Um, but this lattice-based cryptography that, that has sort of uh, been re sort of resurrected the subset sum-based crypto systems, even though we didn't really mention subset sum. I mean, I mentioned a little bit in cryptanalysis, um, cryptanalysis talk. Really, the subset sum-based stuff is the origin of everything that uh, we see today. And today, and now in this talk, I'm going to show you a way that uh, kind of really will drive drive my point home. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the subset sum problem again, and then give you a subset sum, a really, really simple subset sum based CPA secure scheme. I mean, it requires nothing except the hardness of the subset sum problem. And then you will see how sort of a small modification of this gets you an LWE based scheme, you know, which had a pretty simple proof, um, as we saw in the previous talk. Um, and then that, you know, a small modification of that. Uh, that, that was a joke, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, a small modification of that, because you kind of see, okay, there's, there's something inefficient with this LWE thing, what should we do? And we say, ah, well, there's probably something not so hard. Do ring LWE, and you say, okay, well, now we have ring LWE. 
Then there's something like, oh, you know, maybe I'd like to improve a little bit here. You'll see, and like, oh, and then you get something that's entry-like and has a proof of security. And then you're like, well, but what if we change something here? And then you get entry. So this is the, when you see this timeline, you'll see this is really the natural way to have invented lattice-based cryptography. So let's start. The subset sum problem. I'm sorry? So it's, 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 diff it's different. It's different. And you'll see why. So, I, I, so re remind me to, to, if I forget to answer your question. Uh, um, OK. So here's the subset sum problem. Uh, if you remember this, you have your AIs, which are random in ZM. You have this T. And T is a sum of random subset of the AIs. And the goal is to find a subset of the AIs that sums to T mod M. So for example, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you have uh, 15, 30, 14, okay. Good, good. Uh, uh, so I think David suggested that I change the slide slightly, have someone call out the, the thing on the slides, and then, but uh, maybe it was if Daniel suggested this, this evil idea, but I'm not. I'm too lazy. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been good. Okay, so yeah, so this is the subset sum problem. Uh, and how hard is it? As we saw before, it depends on n and m. So, and relationship between n and m, I talked about this before. So, if m is much bigger than n, like 2 to the n squared, we saw that there's the LLL algorithm that breaks subset sum. Over here, it's 2 to the log squared n. Also, there's something else that breaks subset sum. So, if you're going to base uh, your cryptography on subset sum, you want to work here. And here, it's two to the order n algorithms. And uh, I honestly think that this is the way it'll stay. I mean, Chris and I have an ongoing bet. I think 10 years, right? Uh, from a year ago. Yeah, yeah. What? What? 10 years to one year? 10 years? Yeah, 10 years to, uh, to reduce this n to n over log n or n over log log n. And I, I don't think it's going to happen. But OK. So it's kind of the same as lattices. I mean, unless there's an amazing breakthrough in sort of lattice, unless lattices go, subset sum's not going to go either. Um, okay, so now subset sum crypto. Why, why did people in the 1970s, why were they interested in it? Uh, one advantage it has over number theory stuff is the really simple operations. I, I mean, the subset sum problem is just adding things. So presumably in the crypto scheme or whatever you're going to end up doing, you're going to end up adding things. There's going to be no exponentiation, no multiplications, no modular reductions, I mean, complicated ones. Uh, and then, like, uh, like I showed in the previous graph, there's exponential hardness. So subset sum, we believe it is exponentially hard. And uh, it, it is very different from number theoretic assumptions. So, uh, you know, it's not really based on number theory. Uh, so, for example, uh, qu there are quantum attacks that break factoring discrete logs. So maybe you thought factoring discrete log are different enough. Well, they're not, because the same algorithm breaks them both. But uh, quant subset sum crypto is different enough to resist this, this attack. So, you know, it's, it's, diff it's different, so it's nice. So, but what, is the, what was known until, you know, until uh, you know, the late 90s? What was known about subset sum? The only provably secure thing was that subset sum is pseudorandom. Uh, you could also get hash functions, collision resistant hash functions. But something, you know, sort of like a non trivial result is subset sum is pseudorandom. <coughs> and uh, this was a, actually a pretty nice, pretty cute result by Impaliato and Naor uh, in 1989. And what they showed is the following for random A1 through AN in ZM, so a random subset sum instance, and a random um, input, X1 through XN, <coughs> if you can distinguish between this tuple of, uh, not tuple, <coughs> n plus one tuple of n, number, uh, n plus one numbers from the uniform distribution, then you can actually find x1 through xn. And this was a nice application of the Goldberg-Levin theorem. Uh, so, so you see, these, these n guys are always going to be random. Uh, so the only question is, is this somehow dependent on the AIs, or is this completely independent, or is this completely random mod n? So if you can distinguish that, you have uh, 
you, you, you actually can find x1 through xn. So distinguishing, so search equals decision for random subsets. Um, OK, and so now the first result that I'm going to, uh, well, OK, but so this was known. So what about public key encryption? And public key encryption was the first thing that people tried way before they realized your random uh, so randomness was important, they tried to do public key encryption. And there were many, many early attempts. None of them had proofs of security. And it's actually quite deceptive to say that they were based on subset sound. It's something like the, that Oded mentioned, uh, I think, when he was talking about the GGH crypto, uh, crypto system and signature scheme. You can't say that it's based on CVP. It's related to CVP in some sense. It's like RSA is the basement factor. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's inspired by CVP. It's like if you can solve CVP, you can certainly solve, break this crypto system. Um, or if you solve subset sum, you can cer certainly solve, break this crypto system, but it's not quite necessary. So this is the, the, direct, uh, the reduction is the wrong direction. So it just looks like it. So let me give you sort of an example, and so I will, and I will kind of get back to Benny's thing after it. So here is the Merkel-Hellman crypto system. This was the original thing. So what you, and I'm just giving you this for, nothing is going to be based on this later. I'm just giving you this for historical reasons, just because it's simple and you should see how, I don't know, not to do things. Um, uh, so you have A1 through AN, which are super increasing. And this means that AJ is bigger than the sum of all the, all, the sum of all the AIs before it. Well, this is bigger than A1 plus AJ minus 1. So it's super increasing. And... Uh, so if AIs are super increasing, if you know the AIs, and you know that, what is happening? <laughs> um, and you know that the um, uh, some of the, what, it's okay. Uh, the, you know that the there is some element which is a one x one plus dot 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 a and x n. We can actually recover all the x i. Yeah, you see, because if the sum is very big, really, like really big, then you know that AN must have been involved. Because if AN were not involved, you could never get it with the sum of all, anything else, A1, 3, and minus 1. Right? So, okay, great. So the secret key to a crypto system would be a super increasing set, A1 through AN, and some M, modulus M, which is bigger than the sum of all the AIs. And there's some R, which is, uh, which is relatively prime to M. Because clearly, we cannot give away the A1 through AN to everybody, because then everybody will be able to, to decrypt. So you somehow have to hide the super increasing sequence. So they're going to hide it with this R. So the public key was where these vectors, these AIs, multiplied by R, mod M. So once you take the AIs and you multiply by some random element, which no one knows, presumably they're not going to be super increasing anymore. The, the order kind of becomes, looks random, right? <laughs> and now to encrypt, all you do is you compute the subset of the WIs. And that's it. That's the encryption of X1 through Xn. Kind of what? Yeah, let's pretend it's a random message. I mean, this was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. And which is equal to R times the sum of AI XI. All you do is you compute, since you know R, you can compute R inverse. So you multiply the, the ciphertext by R inverse. Now you have A1. Now you have this. And from this, you can recover all the XI. OK? So this was the idea. And the hope, and the hope here, the reason why is, this, why is this based on subset sum, is that somehow R times AI, when you take a super increasing sequence of AIs, you multiply it by R, it looks random. But, but that's not subset sum. In subset sum, these WIs really have to be random. Okay? So this is not, so it's not based on subset sum, it's based on subset sum and this assumption. But this, is, this assumption ended up, turned out being false. So what, the way people were trying to build public key encryption before is by implanting a trap door into the subset sum function. And this kind of takes me back to uh, Benny's thing about Macalise, why I did not mention it in this um, timeline, is because the way we're going to do subset sum based crypto now 
is we're not embedding any trapdoor, right? This is, this is kind of like the difference between um, RSA and LGMAL, right? With RSA, it's a trapdoor-based uh, thing. You can actually recover the randomness in some sense. LGMAL, it's a, it's a valid encryption scheme, but you don't recover the randomness. So the, in some sense, there's no trapdoor in LGMAL, but there is a trapdoor in RSA. So this is the difference. So before, people were trying to build trapdoor-based subsets on constructions, but now we're actually what we're doing with lattices, no trapdoors for CPA security. All right, so now let's build a crypto system that's based on subset sum that is actually based on subset sum without any weird um, R's. All right, so uh, the result is a semantically secure uh, scheme based on subset sum where the modulus is about n to the n. So this is 2 to the n log n. And this was, if you remember, this was in the hard region, the exponentially hard region of where subset sum is solved, can be solved. So the best algorithms for this would be exponential. And uh, the main tools are the following. It's going to be the, this impagliato noah result that subset sum is pseudorandom. And properties of addition. Um, so what we're going to exploit is that addition in ZQ to the N, so in, uh, in ZQ to the N, right, is kind of like addition in ZM where M is Q to the N. And I will explain what kind of like means. So vector addition is kind of like modular addition, modulo something much bigger. So let's, let me, and the proof is really, really simple. So this is, you know, this just will barely keep your brains idling. I think. It's, it's going to come quite close to, to, to stopping them. Um, so here's, here's the main tool. Uh, is basically a fact about addition. Let's say you want to add these four numbers, modulo 10 to the fourth. So how would one do it? You would write the numbers sort of in rows like this, put a line, and start adding the from least significant to most significant. So you do 9 plus 7 plus 5 plus 3. So that's, there's a 4, and there's a 2 that's carried. Uh, you continue, uh, not forgetting the 2. 2 plus 7 plus 6 plus 4. So you put the 9, the 1 is carried. You continue. The 2 is carried, the 8 is carried. I have more examples <laughs> if you want to see. Uh, I mean, this is honest. I mean, okay. The, the talk. Uh, this is <laughs> the, sort of the last time I will actually use numbers. This is the the math that's all the math that's going to be used here. Um, and notice that here there's going to carry, but since I'm doing mod ten to the fourth, this is zero mod ten to the fourth. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the carry is. Okay, it's zero. All right. But if you didn't, if you were not adding these mod ten to the fourth, if you were working in um, uh, if you're adding these as sort of vectors in, in uh, four-dimensional vectors in Z10, you would do the same thing you did before, except there would be no carries. Right? Okay. So the observation is that if you add n numbers written in base Q, here Q was 10, modulo Q to the M, so M was 4 here, then the carries are much less than n, are less than n, right? So if q is much bigger than n, the carry, the, these two numbers are going to be quite close together. Okay? Nothing is happening. So this is what I mean by addition with carries is kind of similar to like addition without carries. Okay. So if Q is much bigger than N, then adding with carries is kind of like adding without carries. Okay. Good. No. Okay. So far, nothing. So what's the point? <laughs> the point is the following. Let's say you have this matrix, 4 by 4 matrix. <coughs> and there's this secret vector, small vector, uh, 0, 1 vector, that's being multiplied by this matrix. So what this means is you're adding the rows. And you get this as the result. If I give you these two together 
and ask you, are these completely random, are these completely random five rows of numbers, or was this last row somehow a small combination of the above rows? Is this, is this a pseudorandom? Is this pseudorandom? The matrix is tall enough, yes. If the matrix is tall enough, good. But what if the matrix is a square matrix where Q, this, um, where the, these numbers, are much bigger than the dimension? Public is both of those things. Public is the blue. The blue is public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the whole thing. If it's clearly not pseudorandom, all you do is you you have this, so you you can solve for you can use, you know invert the matrix and figure out what did I multiply by this matrix to get this number. We can do that. I bet Gaussian elimination was a really amazing cryptanalytic tool like back in the 1800s because it's not an obvious algorithm, right? But uh, okay, if they had crypto, this would have broken a lot. Um, so, so you invert this number, and you get, if you get something small, then you say, look, with high probability, you probably embedded this. You probably picked a small thing to get this guy. Because if this were random, you would get a random number here. Yeah? So this is not pseudorandom. Bad idea. But if you do the exact same thing, this multiplication by this matrix, but now you add the carries that you would have gotten if you were if you were doing uh, it, uh, addition modulo m, like a subset sum, now is it pseudorandom? Exactly, it is pseudorandom based on subset sum. So all you have to do to make this completely insecure function, this vector matrix multiplication that can be solved using Gaussian elimination, pseudorandom, is to add in this these magic carry bits that you would have gotten if you were doing addition modulo m with carries. Yeah? If you keep looking at Zm as if it was a vector of, as if, I mean, you're looking at the components of Zm modulo q, right? No, no, like no. At the D, at the in ba base q, in base q, the digits yeah. in base q. Yeah, that's the next, yeah, what? No, it, it's not a coincidence, right? I mean, I, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, so, okay, so let me just, I mean, this is, this is all that we need, yeah. Uh, actually, I didn't understand. Why is uh, the right side uh, pseudorandom? Why is this pseudorandom? Yeah. Because what I did here, when I'm doing this multiplication and add, do you understand where these yellow, what these yellow numbers are? These yellow Yeah if, yeah, if we read this instead of 4679, it's 4,679 plus 3,907. These are the carries you get when you do the addition like that, right? Modulo 10,000, modulo 10, right? This is pseudorandom because subset sum is pseudorandom. That's the assumption. Subset sum is pseudorandom. Um, no, no, no. There's no wait. There's nothing to think about here. <laughs> this is the but assumption. <laughs> where does the uh, uh, subset sum uh, get in here? I Th this is so. So th these are the these are the these are the numbers. These are the AIs. Oh, Four thousand six seventy nine, three thousand nine hundred seven. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Yes. So we're adding 4,679 plus three thousand nine hundred seven plus one thousand six forty three. That is the subset that we chose. Yeah. Okay. So this is pseudorandom based on subset sum. So, okay, so this was adding rows, but adding columns is also pseudorandom. Okay, so if we read numbers like this, and you know, do a subset sum like that, yeah, it's pseudorandom as well. Okay, yeah, <laughs> nothing happened. And then a hybrid is also pseudorandom. So if we, so we created, you know, we did a subset sum like this, so we added this guy, and now we're gonna treat Whatever we got here, as now these are numbers, 46,790, 39,079. If we treat those as numbers, where this is not really random, but this was 
pseudorandom based on subset sum when we did the rows, but we did the columns. If we do the rows, this is pseudorandom again. But now it's pseudorandom based on a slightly different. So what changed in this slide? What came from? That the last row is not uniformly random. Oh, that, that came from the previous. That came from the previous slide. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, this is, this is completely obvious. I mean, this is, nothing happened. Except, notice that um, the, the assumption changed a little bit, right? Because now the modulus is 10 times bigger, right? Because now you're doing subset sum modulo 100,000 rather than 10,000, because these numbers just grew. Okay? All right. So now this is all you need to get an encryption scheme. So here's the encryption scheme. Here's your matrix A, which consists of a bunch of numbers. It's in ZQN by N. It's public. Here's your secret key, which is the 0, 1 subset sum. Uh, this is the secret uh, subset sum vector. And then I'm going to do AS plus whatever the carries you get when you add these numbers together as a subset sum. So if AS plus the carries equals T. Right? So A and T are the public key. And this is pseudorandom. Just kind of giving you a hint of the proof of security, right? So this is the public key. Now you want to encrypt something. The person picks a random mate, a vector r in 0, 1 to the n, and he's going to do subset sum over the rows. Yeah? So he's going to do subset sum over the rows. So whatever, these are going to be some carries. And this is the answer he gets. And it's going to be, he's going to break it up into u and v. The last number is going to be v, the previous ones are u. And what he's going to do, he's going to put the one, so this is for one bit. He's going to put the one bit message into here somehow. All right, so let's, let's uh, so I think Chris called this the payload. Yes, so the payload, okay. I don't know, there's some sort of a chem dem thing here, but payload maybe is, is more... Uh, standard for this workshop. Okay, this is the payload, and we're going to put a message in here. All right, so based on subset sum, this is pseudorandom, A and T. Again, based on subset sum, A, T, and U, V is pseudorandom. This is the hybrid subset sum that I was doing before. So the adversary who sees A, T, and U, V just sees random things. If he's not, if not seeing random, he just solves subset sum. Good. Notice that V is R times T plus whatever this is. But if you're kind of paying attention, this is actually zero because there are no carries in the beginning. This doesn't matter. So V is R times T, which is equal to R times AS plus some noise. The key thing here is that we're going to set our Q big enough so that when you take the dot product of these yellow, so these um, yellow things and green things and orange things together, they're so small that they're going to be much less than Q, right? S is 0, 1, so that's really small. The carries are less than N, and Q we're going to set to be much bigger than N, you know, a little bit bigger than N, not much, just enough. And the R is, again, really small. And these are really small. So everything in blue is big. Everything in like the other colors, green, orange, red, uh, green, orange, yellow, are small. So when you take the dot product between uh, those colors, you're going to get something small again. So V is R times AS plus something small. U dot S, this is how we're going to decrypt. U dot S is also RA plus something small dot S. So it's again RAS plus something small. So using the secret key, we can actually get something that's very close to V, that should be very close to V. Okay, so this should look like LWE at some point. So we know that V minus US is something small. So now, does anyone have an idea of how to encrypt, how to use this payload to encrypt messages? If given the secret key, we know that V minus u dot s will be something small. Add a bit times half q to, to, to no, to which part? The what? There's a letter there. What's the letter? V, okay. So, yeah, exactly, good. 
So what you do is you just, if you want to encrypt zero, you just, this is the encryption of zero. If you want to encrypt one, add Q over two to V. So V, pr uh, yeah. So you add Q over two to V to get V prime, and you know that V prime minus US is gonna be Q over two plus something small. And that's it. That's, that's nothing, I mean, we, we use no, you know, no, nothing complicated here. And now you have actually a public key encryption based on subset cell. Yes? So does it work in the same part of the Palazzo or no? Or the Pseudo or no? No, I mean, I mean in Palazzo no, or they, it's a general statement, right? Right, so it works on, on the wider line of the parameters, right? Is, is there no, because if you work on the other side of the parameters, it really is a random number. It's a random generator by the leftover hash lemma. Oh, yeah, on the left side, right? On this side? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, no, mean, so. so not not too large, just a little bit. Uh, I said end to the end. Yeah, the carry should be small. So so I said the carries are less than n, but you can actually prove that there's randomness, so they're actually less than root n, squared n, exactly. So yeah, but the impedance and the or result it works for the entire that side because for this side it's not interesting because it really is random. So yeah, I mean yes, yeah, sure, the result works for a whole thing, but uh, okay. So any any more any questions about subset sum? Okay. So once you have subset sum, you can uh, you can kind of ask what what did we really need? What was necessary for this scheme to go through? You needed these three things to be pseudo random to each other. Right? That was important for security. And you needed these Four to be small because we kind of do we're doing dot products with each other, and uh, and we wanted the dot products to remain small. So, the question is, why do these yellow things have to be these carries that come from subset sum? Would the problem be any easier? I mean, intuitively, if they were random, it seems like it would even be harder, right? Because now they have nothing to do with the instance. Yeah. So. In subset sum, the carries were deterministic, so they kind of uh, depended on, on uh, just depended on the A's and the S, so that you don't really pick the carries at random. But what if we pick the carries at random? So this is to a random based on subset sum. That's what we had before. But what if we or maybe we even inc decide to increase the S. You know, why, why, why just zero ones? Why not just something maybe a little bigger? A Gaussian, for example, why not? Uh, doesn't matter what the distribution is. I mean, the, the proof of security will go, th uh, the proof of um, correctness will go through. You'll still be able to decrypt. The decryption did not care about the distribution. And you know, maybe these have nothing to do with the carries either. Maybe these are also random. Intuitively, there's no reason that if this is uh, uh, secure, that doing that this should not be secure. I mean, it would be shocking. Um, but in, and in fact, it is, and it's pseudo random based on learning with errors and, and lattices. Okay? So, okay, so that's it. So this, is, so this is how one would possibly get LW. You have subset sum, you say, well, you know. Uh, let's let's make things random. But I guess the question now is why would you do this? Why why? I mean, this seems clearly superior. I mean, you can pick zero small small elements, zero ones. You don't have to pick the noise. I mean, why would you ever not uh, do something else? There really is a reason. So let, let me let me go, let me tell you what it is. So the subset sum is nice because the the carries are kind of deterministic. On the other hand, the LWU assumption is more versatile because, because the carries are not deterministic, because you have this noise that you can pick that is independent of the A's. Um, so here's the LWU problem. Let's say, for example, you need n squared samples, right? So you pick n squared AIs, right? And then you have some secret S, and then you add completely random errors. And A S plus C equals B. This is hard. If you can solve this, as we saw in the proof, uh, just, just be Oded's proof just before, 
if you can solve this, you can break lattice problems. So here we really have um, some sort of guarantee that if we have a lot of samples, the problem will not sort of become trivial all of a sudden. With subset sum, let's say you have the same thing. Let's say I want n squared samples, right? So now, do you, does anyone, do you want to stare at this for a little bit to see what, uh, what this means? Well, no, not stare at the next slide. Well, no, actually, the next slide uh, doesn't tell you why. So if you want n squared samples, what you're really going to be doing is you're going to be summing n numbers, which are modulo what? What is the modulo? What is, how big are these numbers? What? Q to the n squared. Q to the n squared. Good. Exactly. Good. So what you're doing is you're summing n numbers that are q to the n squared, because these numbers are written in base q, right? And these carries are no longer random. These are actual carries. And for this, there is an algorithm that breaks up sets up, right? So you cannot, so this is the, the problem of having deterministic carries. You cannot have, two, this matrix cannot be too long. Okay? So does that have to be square, or can it be? It could be whatever you want, as long as the subset sum problem in modulo q to the however many column uh, rows you have is not, is not hard. Right, I forgot what the subset sum comes in again. Uh, well, you have. <laughs> it becomes easy exactly when it's q to the n squared, to the n squared. So you want to keep it like a constant times n is okay, uh, constant times n log n is okay. Uh, you know, the, the bigger you make it, the more y the less secure in practice it becomes. Whereas LWE, it's not clear. The, the more you, you have, the less secure it becomes. At some point, it doesn't become less secure. OK? All right, so this is why you may want to use LWE. And then, so if you had subset sum, you would say, you would say OK, let's make LWE and prove it's secure. And that's what we have. Great. So, so there's a reason for moving from subset sum to LWE. But let's, um, let's see what, what's wrong with LWE. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be the end of the story. Um, if you want to encrypt n bits, the LWE public key size, well, you have a choice. You can either have order n or order n squared, the public key size, the amortized stuff. The secret key size, because the matrix A, in some sense, we don't count it as part of the public key because the matrix A could be shared by everyone. So the only public key part is this T. Okay, so if you want to encrypt n bits, the public key size is approximately order n. Or if you want to be more efficient in some things, order n squared. The secret key is either order n or order n squared. Ciphertext expansion is order n or order 1. So if you want to have less ciphertext expansion, you have to do um, more, you have to have your public key and secret key be bigger. I'm not going to explain this too much. Uh, encryption time is also kind of big. And decryption time is also kind of big. So these are not really optimal things. What we really want is linear public key, linear secret key, uh, constant ciphertext expansion, linear exp encryption time, linear decryption time. You can't do any better than this. So this is kind of, uh, this is what we want. OK? LWE does not really give us this. So this should not be the end of the story. We want to look for an improvement. What, is, what should be the next thing we do? Rings. <laughs> OK, so this is, let's do a crypto system based on ring LWE. What was the source of inefficiency of LWE? Intuitively, the problem was that whenever you did a dot product and you added a, a noise, you really got just one extra random looking number. And what it required was a dot product with n random numbers and the small error element. What, so, so it's a lot of work to do just to get one extra random number. And this is the cause of all the problems in LWE. What you really wish is you know you have this and this. Instead of doing a dot product, you could do a multiplication somehow, add some noise, and end up with n random numbers. So get n random numbers in one shot. And for this, you use polynomials. 
as we did yesterday. So just to remind you what a polynomial is, you'll need it for Craig's talk. Uh, you have, uh, so f of x is a polynomial, whatever, a n, you know, this is a polynomial, a monic polynomial. Uh, here's a ring, zpx mod f of x is a ring that has addition mod q and polynomial multiplication mod p and f of x. And each element of the ring consists of n elements in zp. Right? So every polynomial can be defined by n elements in zp. And what we have in R is uh, small plus small is small, and small times small is also small. Okay? So we want the product and the, uh, and the sum to kind of keep the coefficient small. Okay. So here is the polynomial interpretation of this LWE-based system that I had. So before you had a matrix A, a vector S, a vector you know, noise equals a vector T. Now everything is going to be polynomial. There are no more matrices. So the public key is just a polynomial A times a polynomial uh, and a polynomial T, which is AS plus a polynomial. So this is the public key in... Um, so yesterday I didn't construct you a crypto system based on ring LWE, but so I'm doing this now. So this is the public key in the ring LWE crypto system. Every box is a polynomial. Okay? And here's the encryption. Here's the interpretation of encryption, the natural interpretation of encryption of LWE in the ring LWE setting. You, have, you pick your, remember before we picked a vector R, now we pick a polynomial R. For, first we multiply it by A and add some noise, that's U. And then we multiply it by t and add some noise, and that's v. And now notice v is an n, L, n um, there are n elements in v, so maybe we can now encrypt n bits instead of just one bit. Before v was just one, one thing, but now it's n, so it's even better. Okay, so now u and v, these two polynomials, u and v, these are your payload. And they, they satisfy kind of the same relationship as before. We have r times t plus something, this, that's v, minus r times a plus something, that's u, times s, the secret key. So if we know the secret key, we can recover v minus u times s. Okay? So now, where do you put the secret key? So, I mean, what, what do we do with this v minus u times s? Well, you also have that r times a s plus something. So that's this guy, r times t. Minus r a plus something, that's u, times s, is something very small. Right? Using this fact, we get this. So we're doing exactly what we did for LWE, except now with polynomials. So now, where do we put the message? It's, it's the same letter. <laughs> v. Okay, and uh, how big is the mess? How many bits can you encrypt? What? Size, uh, dimension of the polynomial, right? So that's n, let's say, right? And so how do you encrypt the bits? What? In each coefficient, right. So you take your bits and write them as a polynomial, let's say a 0, 1 polynomial, and then multiply it by q over 2. And you add it to v. Yes? Just, I mean, if you stare at this and work out the boxes and the colors, you will end up with yellow, <laughs> which, uh, which, short. what yellow? No, yellow is short. So remember, blue is uh, blue is long. Um, I guess these are long too because this is purple on my screen. Uh, and all the colors that are like yellow, orange, and green, which to me they're kind of similar, uh, <laughs> they are short, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, no, right? I mean, these are kind of from the same family in some sense. No? no? <laughs> it's not obvious to everyone. <laughs> no, I mean, these are the same colors. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I mean, if you were going to say, like, what's, you know, which color does not belong? Blue, yellow, orange, green. You would say blue, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not obvious. <laughs> I mean, I... What? Oh. No, it doesn't matter what a mixture No, but... I'm not... <laughs> really? Okay. I wish somebody told me, because I've been... <laughs> okay. Anyway. So... Okay. Uh, okay, I see why this could be more confusing than I thought. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, so you put your message in V. And uh, let's prove security. So, so everything works out. You, you can decrypt. Uh, so now let's prove security. Are these guys pseudorandom? If you see A, T, U, and V. And the answer is yes, by ring LWE. A and T are pseudorandom because A times S plus something equals T. And if S and something are both small, kind of come from the same Gaussian distribution, that's pseudorandom. Therefore, A and T are pseudorandom. And if you do RA plus something is U and then RT plus something is V, that's pseudorandom as well. Okay? Again, based on ring LW. So remember the decision, this is the ring of the problem, if you don't remember. Um, uh, in world one, you have m polynomials am. In world two, you have m polynomials uh, am as well. But the bi's are completely random, whereas in world one, there really is a small s and a small um, noise, a bunch of noises, noise polynomials, so that as plus noise is b1, a2s plus noise is b2, etc. And so what we proved is that in cyclotomic rings, there is a reduction from search LWE to decision ring LWE. So this problem really is based on ring LWE, search ring LWE. And I guess it's worth pointing out that we don't really need the full sort of the strength of L ring LWE to say, look, if you have M samples, it works out. We only need two for this part. So this is two. Uh, technically three because S is now a small polynomial, so you need an extra sample to make S small using the reduction that Chris presented. So three. But, yeah. but it's not M, so it's two or three depending on how you look at it. Okay, so instead of question marks, these are exclamation points. This really is pseudo random based on ring LW. And now, what if you use polynomials in ZPX mod f of x? So from LWE, you had this not so good, uh, not so good um, sizes of ciphertext and uh, encryption times. Whereas with ring LWE, you have everything is almost optimal up to these tildes on the O's. Um, these logarithmic parameters. So the public key size is really order n because it's just this t. And you know, if you want to add a, it's also still order n. The secret key size is order n. The ciphertext expansion is order 1, because you could put n bits into v instead of 1 as before. The encryption time is order n, because doing multiplication, ra and rt, can be done in time order n again using uh, the fast Fourier transform. And decryption is also polynomial uh, order n time because what all you do is you multiply u by s and subtract v. And that u times s is also, uh, order, can be done in order n log n using FFT. So, okay, so this is ring LLE. Now we are almost there. So what else can possibly be improved? Okay, so this is the next thing, which I'm not quite sure if, it, if it's more efficient, but it's, it's nicer in, 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 in one particular aspect, which leads us to something much more efficient afterwards. So let's look at the number of ring elements in, uh, in our encryption. So to encrypt the message M, you have this polynomial U and this polynomial V plus the message times P over 2. Okay. Can you have, the question is, so now that there's two, two polynomials which are, um, which are the ciphertext. I guess the question you might want to ask is, can you have a ciphertext with just one ring element? Well, why not, right? If you can keep the ring, I mean, it's, if, even if you can, it doesn't mean it's going to be better. If you can keep, you know, if the ring becomes much bigger, uh, that's not better. But let's, let's just have that as the criteria. Can you have just one ring element? Because there's something here that sort of seems to require two. Right? And, you know, it wasn't immediately clear. I mean... It's not, uh, if it were clear to us, we would do it, but we didn't do it. So this is not, not, not so obvious. Um, and so this was uh, done by Stelle and Steinfeld. 
after our work on Ring LWE, they said, here's how you do um, a one-element crypto system. The public key is it's now a little different. The public key is now the, the quotient of two polynomials, f and g. If you pick f and g, which are not with, L, with uh, small coefficients, but not too small, enough that the entropy of f and g taken together is bigger than uh, the size of the ring, they prove that f divided by g is actually statistically close to random. So they, given a, so f, and f divided by g, the public key, is going to look completely uniformly random, but what the secret key are these small polynomials whose ratio is, uh, whose uh, quotient is A. So th this is, this, these are the secret keys, this is the public key. Now, to encrypt an element, what you do is the following, and here's where you use ring LWE. You have your U. Uh, you know, just choose it with, with good probability it's going to be. If it's not, choose it again. Right? You can actually calculate what the probability is exactly of G being invertible. It's not one minus negligible. No, no, it's not one minus negligible. It's actually one divided, so one minus one divided by P to the N. What? Okay, so here's how you encrypt. You have your A, you pick a random R, you do A, A, A R plus noise. So this is this should be pseudorandom, right? A R plus noise, this is ring LWE. Then you multiply it by two. And this multiplication by two, if you saw Craig uh, doing his uh, FHE stuff, they do this multiplication by two. Instead of multiplying by Q over two, they do they do multiplication by two. And we'll see what happens. So you multiply this by two and you add your message. So it's actually kind of simpler I would say doing this than multiply by Q over two. Okay? So you do this and you mod P. That's it. That's the encryption. Okay, so it's quite simple. And now to, to decrypt, you don't even need F. You just multiply U by G. So what is U times G? This is G secret. No one knows it. It's two times. So you multiply G in. G times A is F, right? G times this is uh, small. So you have two times FR plus something small times G plus G times the message. Now, here's the key part. This is all so small, because the message is small, G is small. I mean, you know, these colors are all the same, right? So, so they're all small. And um, therefore, the, you do not get reduction modulo P. Therefore, is there a question? Yeah. You don't get reduction modulo P. Here, A times R plus something, you really did reduce mod P. But when you multiply by G, this is as if you're doing multiplication in the ring, not modulo P. Because you never get this rollover. So now what you can do is you can just do UG mod 2. You can do mod 2. You cannot do mod 2 and hope to, get, hope to get rid of this mod 2 when you're doing reduction modulo P as well. Right? You can't do like mod 7 and then mod 2 and get uh, the right answer. But now, since you never got reduced mod P, you can do mod 2. So now you get G times M, divide by G, uh, take this mod 2, divide by G, and you get M. So G also has to be invertible uh, mod 2, okay? But that, that happens uh, also. What's the assumption here? So what, what do you, so what do you think the assumption is here? Oh, A is easy from the random. What? A is, 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 is statistic. Yeah, A is really random. There's no assumption on the A. The only assumption is, does U look, does, does U look random? And the answer is yes. Because AS plus the AR plus this is random, based on ring LWE. Multiplying by 2 does not make a difference, because 2 and P are relatively prime. So random times 2 is still random, mod P. And adding the message also does not affect anything. Okay, so that so this is oh, it's a pretty clean crypto system. I mean, much I guess much fewer things at being added and subtracted than before. What? I'm oh, sorry. No more colors. Oh, more colors. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't. Anyway. No, the same number of colors, just fewer ring elements. Um, okay, so what more could be done? We already have one element, and here's the here's the observation. 
what if we're we don't, what if we don't care about A being uniformly random? What if we just care about A being, you know, just looking, looking random? Perhaps we can lower F and G. And why would you want to lower the size of F and G? What would be the advantage of making the size of F and G smaller? The size of the coefficients of F and G. Decryption's faster? Decryption's faster? Uh, possibly, yeah. But then that's not the main. You can make p smaller for correctness. So the restriction on the size of f of the size of p, we have to set p big enough so that this thing is less than p. Yeah. And um, and uh, the size of the ciphertext depends on p, right? It's n log p. So if you can make p smaller, you're decreasing the size of your ciphertext. And then you can also decrease n, uh, and then you know it's a win-win-win thing. So, and here's the original Entro crypto system with amazing foresight. <laughs> you know, seeing you know thir for 14 years of research, they said, well, <laughs> let's make f and g. <laughs> okay, it doesn't. They probably didn't. Okay, <laughs> let's make f and g smaller. <laughs> let's pretend that f over g actually does look random then everything still works out fine. If you assume that A is random, this is based on the hardness of ring LWE, and everything decrypts as before. Nothing, I mean, nothing changed. This is the same crypto system, so F and G are smaller. So does that mean you can have a precise assumption now saying that the GRU assumption is that F over G is pseudo random? And, and ring LWE. I don't think ring I don't think this, the, I don't think these two imply each other. Caveat, because entry is done over the ring x to the n minus 1. If you do it, what? Uh, yeah, exactly. But it doesn't, but you, so you can't claim that ring LWE is hard over that ring. So it's kind of a, but if you just instantiate entry over x to the n plus 1, for example, then yes, you can make it a, a clean assumption. You can make the clean assumption that um, f over g looks random and this thing. Um, so, you could also no. make a clear assumption about the not random. You know? What? You could also make a, a clear assumption about the security of not random. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, you could make a clean assumption. Extra assumption. Yeah, exactly. So this is the, okay, yes, yes. So good. So kind of going back, uh, Benny said, well, this is exactly the, <laughs> the problem that we had uh, with Merkel Hellman, right? You made this, oh, these A's look random. Oh, and they, it was false. The thing about <laughs> true is that uh, it's been around for 14 years. And no one has ever found how this is um, not random. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't help in this case. Um, there is no, but again, so entry, the textbook entry, is done without noise. There is no noise in, in textbook entry. U is just 2AR plus M. So this is not even semantically secure, but the way, but this is a trapdoor function. And so the way they, they construct a, um, a crypto system is using random oracles, using the, these transformations that convert trapdoor function to CCA secure schemes, and, and then it's secure. But if you want a CPA secure entry, it's this. You, you, can, you can say this, this entry is CPA secure. And then, you know, do whatever you want with random oracles and get it to CCA, because that's what we really want. We want CCA secured. Right? You, you need random oracles anyway. Okay? And so, yeah, and this, this is just for reference. It's the same thing. Encryption. And so, that's it. So, why not? So, yeah, so, so let, me, let me just say that... that um, while entry signature is broken, the encryption scheme is still sort of the best we have. And really, if one is going to implement lattice-based encryption, I would say, you know, there's nothing wrong with entry. And it's, again, a pretty amazing uh, foresight <laughs> that they have, that they really got the right, uh, the right thing 14 years ago before why we knew it was correct. Okay, so, yeah. Ron? I'm sorry? Yeah, if you can... Um, 
So if you can solve LWE, you can solve worst case lattice problems, right? And you can, if you can solve those worst case lattice problems, you can solve subset sum, but you get a worse reduction than you get right away from the crypto system. So, so Thanks.